The Black Death was a harrowing time in 14th century Europe, marked by three variations of the plague, bubonic, septicemia, and pneumonic, resulting in the devastating loss of an estimated 60% of the population. To put that in perspective, it would be equivalent to 450 million people today. In this discussion, we'll explore ways one could have potentially survived the Black Plague. Before we dive in, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and drop a quaint yet memorable comment below. Let's embark on this journey together. While our advancements in technology and science have propelled human evolution, viruses and our fundamental biology remain unchanged. In 2019, safeguarding against diseases like the plague involved steering clear of crowded places where the risk of transmission was higher. The pneumonic plague spread through airborne droplets, making places with numerous individuals coughing and sneezing potential breeding grounds for infection. On the other hand, the bubonic plague transmitted through flea bites, typically associated with infected mice. In social settings conducive to disease transfer, rodents carrying plague-infested fleas could pass the illness on to humans. Infected individuals were often unaware they were spreading the disease, as their bodies harbored super fleas capable of leaping up to two meters away to find a new, healthier host. To reduce the risk of contracting the Black Death, Maintaining a distance of more than two meters from areas infested with plague-carrying fleas was a prudent strategy. Perhaps staying home and engaging in activities like binge-reading the Bible was a safer alternative during such times. Seal it tight and stay put. Italy, with its many entry points surrounded by water, faced numerous threats of the plague entering the country. When news of the Black Death reached Milan, the ruler at the time, a stern figure named, took drastic measures. Houses of those affected by the plague were ordered to be sealed, trapping the occupants inside and preventing any contact with the outside world. Though this approach was harsh, condemning healthy family members to confinement with the sick, it proved effective. Milan emerged with only a 15% mortality rate, the lowest among major Italian cities. The victory, however, came at a cost, involving sacrifices of innocent lives and a halt to social activities, including the unsettling practice of rummaging through the remains of the recently deceased. Italy, famous for its delectable lasagna, had a grim portrayal of its streets in the past, vividly described by a Florentine writer. Picture this, mass burial sites resembling layers of pasta and cheese, with victims and dirt stacked together like a nightmarish lasagna. Even exposure to the plague, even from the deceased, could make you a part of this macabre dish. Disturbingly, loved ones often left their dead in the streets without proper burial, as the knowledge of burning the deceased, a lesson later emphasized by Game of Thrones, wasn't prevalent in the 1300s. As the body count rose, so did the number of decaying corpses in the streets. A group known as the Bikini, not related to the bathing suit, emerged. These were men of lower social status who, being already afflicted with the plague, took on the grim task of removing the deceased from the cities. Unfortunately, some of them resorted to robbery and murder. Yet, faced with the challenge of dealing with highly infectious corpses, the Bikini played a crucial role in keeping the streets clear. Meanwhile, wealthy individuals gathered their diamonds and furs, fleeing the plague-ridden streets. Although burning the bodies wasn't a common practice, there was some consideration of the magical healing power of fire. One remarkable survivor of the plague was Pope Clement IV, residing in Avignon, where a staggering one-third of the cardinals fell victim to the disease. Despite the grim circumstances, Pope Clement found an unconventional solution. Doctors advised him to sit in a ring of fire to prevent infection. Surprisingly, it worked, and he remained unharmed. The strategy was ingenious. The ring of fire acted as a deterrent for rats, the carriers of the disease. Seeing a healthy body surrounded by flames, the rodents chose to avoid the obstacle and seek easier, less flammable targets. Similarly, humans were unlikely to walk into a ring of fire just to have a conversation with the Pope. In a similar vein, in 1666, the notorious year associated with the devil, the Great Fire of London devastated the city. While causing widespread destruction, it also had an unintended positive effect. It wiped out a significant population of rats and fleas, which were conduits for the bubonic plague. Few things in life seem more perplexing than the peculiar uniforms worn by old-timey doctors. However, 
It's essential to remember that their understanding of contagion was not as advanced as ours today. According to the Italian author Giovanni Boccaccio, physicians during the plague were ill-equipped to handle cases due to their lack of knowledge about treating the disease. In fact, some earlier doctors may have unwittingly contributed to the spread of the disease by not using adequate protection against contamination. After years of grappling with the illness, doctors eventually devised a specific uniform to safeguard themselves. And let's be honest, it looked pretty cool. This late century ensemble, first donned by the trend-setting Dr. Charles Delorme in France, featured a long overcoat, a hat, and a distinctive mask that resembled a bird. The beak of the mask, worn by adult men, was believed to provide protection by being filled with pleasant-smelling items like rose petals and mint. This design was based on the belief that foul air, known as miasma, spread diseases. So the logical solution was to surround oneself with pleasant smells. Moreover, the leather outfit served a dual purpose, not only protecting doctors from flea bites, but also, perhaps, instilling fear in fleas by presenting them with human-sized birds. It was a quirky, yet practical approach to dealing with a deadly and mysterious disease. Staying alive during the Black Death epidemic was no picnic, and spending time with flagellants didn't make things any better. For those unfamiliar, flagellants were individuals who subjected themselves or others to flogging, either as a religious practice or for personal satisfaction. They were essentially religious zealots determined to whip away sin. During the Black Death, these flagellants saw their heyday. Many Europeans believed that the plague was a divine punishment for their sins, so they sought atonement by publicly whipping themselves. However, this public display of repentance didn't grant immunity from the plague. In fact, it made matters worse because flagellants were well-traveled, spreading the disease wherever they went, a definite downside. To survive the plague, it was probably a good idea to steer clear of these flagellants and their wandering ways. The last thing you needed during an epidemic was to be around folks unintentionally carrying and spreading the disease. Imagine it as creating a protective bubble around your city, screening out anyone suspected of carrying the plague. City entrances were fortified with armed guards, ready to deny entry to anyone showing signs of a low-grade fever. While this strategy prevented potentially infected individuals from entering the cities, it also confined those already afflicted within. In addition to deploying armed guards, some European cities took it a step further by refusing to allow ships to dock in their ports. Since ships from the east were the initial carriers of the plague into Europe, ports quickly became more discerning about which ships were permitted to dock. By 1348, Venice implemented a 30-day period for travelers and goods suspected of carrying the plague. Essentially, a go hang out over there and don't talk to anybody for a while measure. This duration was later extended to 40 days, or as they say in Italy, quaranta giorni, giving rise to the term quarantini. While these measures did slow down the spread of the illness, they were not entirely effective. Despite their efforts, tens of thousands of people still succumbed to the Black Death in Venice. When it came to dealing with the plague, plague law was the name of the game. Think no ships, homes sealed tight, and curfews galore. Several European cities went all in with martial law to combat the rampant spread of the disease, and with an 80% mortality rate, who could blame them? Take landlocked Pistorius in northern Italy, for instance. Unable to turn away ships and shut down ports, they compensated by tightening the screws on imports, exports, travel, trading, markets, and even funerals. Despite these drastic measures, Pistorius still saw a jaw-dropping loss of 70% of its population to the unforgiving plague. Amidst all these disheartening percentages, it's essential to remember that some people in that era did contract the plague and actually survived. They weren't tying live chickens around their swollen plague bumps or sipping refreshing glasses of chilled arsenic. No. Their secret was having robust immune systems because they took care of themselves, even in a time before keto diets and CrossFit gyms. Back then, without the luxury of the internet, people still understood the value of maintaining good health. Recent research affirms what was true then and remains so now. If you were in poor health before getting the disease, your chances of succumbing to it were significantly higher. This was particularly true for those who were malnourished, had dental issues, or had weakened immune systems. Healthy individuals, while not immune to infection, had a higher likelihood of survival. So, take a cue from your yogi. Consider those juice cleanses. 
but also step outside into the chilly air because, surprisingly, your chances of survival were greater in the winter. It turns out, even in the absence of internet and fitness trends, people in the past recognized the importance of overall well-being. Unlike our contemporary flu and common colds, the plague has a preference for a milder climate, making its presence more pronounced during the warmer summer and spring seasons. Interestingly, the plague was nearly non-existent in the winter, a bit like when Brenda calls in sick with the flu in July, which always raises eyebrows. If you were seeking to survive an epidemic of apocalyptic proportions, one option was to pack up the kids and move to Norway. However, the plague eventually decided Maybe I do like cold weather, you losers, and spread throughout Europe, including the chilly confines of Norway. Surprisingly, Norway experienced 30 plague outbreaks between 1348 and 1654, though curiously, none occurred during the winter. The plague has a knack for keeping us on our toes. One wonders if the people of the 14th century ever pondered the idea of being born with immunity. Well, indeed, there was a genetic immunity that played a role in the complex dynamics of the plague. While some folks may be blessed with ageless skin or crystal blue eyes, others luck out with genetic immunity to a disease that wreaked havoc on Europe, boasting an 80% mortality rate. The Roma people, in particular, possessed specific gene clusters that shielded them from falling victim to the deadly plague. Researchers discovered several genes that likely played a role in protecting certain individuals from succumbing to the disease. It wasn't a complete immunity for the Roma. They could still contract the illness. However, there was a genetic variation that triggered an immune response against Yersinia pestis, the bacteria responsible for wiping out a significant portion of the continent's population. Lucky for some, genetics had their back in the face of this devastating plague. As mentioned earlier, Europeans firmly believed in two demonstrably false assumptions about the spread of the disease. First, they thought the thick stench of sickness lingering in the air was the physical embodiment of the disease itself. While the disease was indeed airborne, it didn't actually have a detectable smell. Second, the prevailing belief was that all this calamity was God's furious response to the rampant sin of the time. With no TV, limited entertainment, and the monotony of 1328, it's understandable that people found creative ways to explain their misfortunes. In that era, there were no books, research, or the wealth of knowledge we have today regarding how diseases spread. Back then, People could be forgiven for avoiding extremely foul air and opting to clutch an extra rosary bead or two for good measure. And if that didn't work, well, there was always the screw it approach, a personal favorite tip for surviving the plague. Our good friend Boccaccio shared tales of some Florentines who decided to embrace life to the fullest, vowing to carouse, make merry, sing, frolic, and indulge in every possible pleasure. While Europe was grappling with a painfully misunderstood disease, striking down one in three people, thousands did everything in their power to avoid the plague, only to succumb to it. Recognizing the grim reality, some Europeans decided to live life to the fullest. They went to the bar, danced, drank, and ate, understanding that avoiding the bacteria might be sadly unavoidable. Considering the life expectancy in 1400 was around 30, they adopted a screw it attitude, surprisingly. Those who embraced life just as much as those who drank in moderation met the same fate. Here's to you, 1300s Europe. You paved the way for us to appreciate life a bit more. Nowadays, we can still get the plague, but fortunately, antibiotics make curing it a breeze. It's a remarkable invention we might not fully appreciate, given that we've never had to contemplate moving to Norway to dodge the Black Death. Cheers to progress.